if you're in another location good afternoon uh, or evening if you're joining from uh, from australia or new zealand um I'm looking forward to today's session. My name is Varun Malik. Uh, you have to excuse my birth. I had to take this call from home and, you know, every time I speak, they start speaking as well. Um, so uh, very quickly, I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is new age in the sense that we did not take the traditional consulting model of growing a consulting firm. Uh, Instead of hiring a lot of consultants, we instead partnered with a lot of boutique consulting firms. Um, this model allowed us to grow very quickly. So when we set up in 2017, uh, in the next three years, we already had more than 500 consultants to choose from. Uh, we had uh, we delivered almost 200 consulting projects. Um, so 2020 was, of course, supposed to be a great year for us. Uh, like most people, uh, you know, we were really, really looking forward. It was the start of a new decade. It was, uh, you know, uh, it was going to be a great year. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, things didn't turn out that way for most organizations. Uh, so after our initial shock of March and April, what we decided to do was spend any excess capacity that we had to uh, give back and to uh, uh, try and get organizations back on track. Uh, for example, one of the projects we started in uh, in uh, 2020 was the Superheroes Project, where we got about 700 business leaders from across the GCC to help small businesses and micro businesses get back on track. Um, because they were the ones, of course, micro businesses that were suffering the most in 2020. This year, we decided, let's try and, uh, you know, we have a lot of boutique consulting firms. There's a lot of expertise in our ecosystem. Uh, why don't we get the boutique consulting firms to put together their ideas, their thoughts, their knowledge to also larger organizations? Uh, so the result of that idea was this web summit called Connected Insights. Connected Insights is a web summit running over seven days. We have about 50 uh, panel discussions and webinars. Uh, we had uh, five workshops. We have one more tomorrow evening. Um, and uh, what we're looking at is, uh, you know, getting people like yourselves to come and engage with us, share thoughts, share ideas, and we learn from each other. So you might have noticed that we've made you all panelists rather than attendees. Now, the idea of doing that was that we, uh, we engage with you as well. So feel free to, during today's discussion, uh, raise your actual hands if you're on video or raise you know, uh, use the raise hand feature on Zoom and ask questions. You can ask questions on the chat or you can ask questions verbally. Um, look out for some giveaways. So the last housekeeping point for me is in the chat, you will see that we're doing some giveaways. So for example, uh, we're gonna tell you what other talks we have. Today's day six of this, uh, of this seven day web summit. And we've had more than uh, 1,100 uh, participants join us in the first five days. Um, so what we're going to do is we're giving some giveaways. One is attending some of the other panel discussions, the workshop that we have tomorrow. Um, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let's engage uh, rather than just listen, if, if, if that's okay. Uh, so that's it from me. I'm uh, really excited about today's talk. Uh, it's done by a very uh, innovative innovation management firm called Erewhon. Uh, Gokul, who's speaking today, I'm really looking forward and over to you. And sorry about the birds again, guys. Thank you. It's a welcome sound to have around. Indeed. So good morning, good day, and good evening to everyone, uh, whichever part of the world you're joining from. I hope you're able to hear me clearly. And I hope my screen is all visible for you all. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. So, I mean, uh, I mean, I, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Varun and his team for putting together such a phenomenal uh, uh, you know, summit, web summit. I'm sure that uh, in moments like this, the times that we are in, I think it's a phenomenal platform for all of us to connect with each other and learn. And I think fairly, uh, you know, to be fair, 
I think the notion of having a connected insight is a phenomenal thought, and I love the word of connected insights when I heard it. So thanks, Varun, and thanks, team, for making this connection happen between all of us. So my name is Gokul Ranganathan. Uh, I am an innovation interventionist and an innovation facilitator. My firm, uh, Erwan Innovation Consulting, we are based in Bangalore. And we work with organizations across the world to make innovations happen, uh, if I have to put it in simple terms. Uh, we are not domain experts, but we are pure play innovation experts. And we have a fairly good uh, experience uh, over the three decades on what it takes to make innovation happen by design. So when the pandemic started, uh, uh, I, I think it, it was a great opportunity for me to step back and reflect on what it takes to unleash uh, innovation in the space of operations. Uh, which is what or unleash uh, transformation in the space of operation. How do we make it happen by design? I must say the last uh, five years or so has been quite interesting and phenomenal uh, for me and very, very enriching because uh, I had the opportunity to uh, facilitate and uh, you know run some really great interventions on the ground uh, where uh, it was a blind spot for all of us and it was a happy accident that happened where we discovered maybe operations is one of the best ways and best vehicles available out there to uh, you know, unlock value for the organization. And like you were talking, both top line as well as bottom line. So what I'm going to be sharing folks is the learning that I have articulated for my own self on how to make value leaps happen in organizations by design. Uh, what are some of the organizations that we have worked with? How have they done it? And uh, with the thousand plus innovation journeys that we have had the opportunity to facilitate, I would like to bring this all learning as much as I can uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes of this talk. That's what I'd like to do. So let me start off uh, with this question. Uh, anchoring to a leap, uh, what, do we, what is a leap and how do we see it? I think it's only fair that uh, we set a reference point or an anchor point for this discussion of how we see leap. You know, when we work with organizations, leaders over the past three decades, we find that thinking happens in four zones, if I might say. Uh, the trigger for a thinking could be either be problem-led or opportunity-led, reactive or proactive. And the resulting impact of a given thinking could either be an incremental impact or a quantum impact. And like I said, an incremental, we are talking about steps. A quantum, we are talking about a massive jump. Now, accordingly, be it at an industry level, an organization level, a business level, a function level, or even an individual leader level, we find all these four zones happening. The moment a thinking is problem-led and it gives an incremental thinking, we find that the nature of thinking that happens most of the time is what we call as quick fixes. I'm sure we all have had our fair shares of uh, having our daily dosages of firefighting, something that is becoming fairly unavoidable, I might say, be it at the CEO level or be it at the frontline level. It's an, a necessary devil that we have to deal with. Now, so the quick fixes are day-to-day -day problems. How do you quickly solve it? Uh, a bit, there could be a problem in my supply chain. How do I quickly fix it? My distributor is not responding. There's a stock out on the line. How do I fix it? So firefighting, quick on the fly thinking to resolve the issue and move on, incremental impact. Now the same thinking when it happens, opportunity led, which is more proactive uh, and it gives incremental impact where what we find is the nature of thinking is I'm sure you would agree with me, is one of continuous improvement. Now, I'm not using the continuous improvement terms from the parlance of a conventional manufacturing, but from the philosophy of a continuous improvement. Now, like the word says, uh, here the intent is fairly simple. Let's keep improving ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis, on a quarterly basis. So the focus is, am I doing better than what I did last year? Are we doing better than what we did the previous quarter? So the focus is a continuous improvement. Now, let's shift to the top. Where for a given problem, we are not talking about a quick fix, but a transformative solution. A solution that can give a quantum impact and can create a phenomenal value, can unlock a phenomenal value for the organization. Not just continuous improvement, but game-changing leaps. Now, we find that thinking typically happens in these four zones in any organization. And as you are looking at this, I'm sure uh, sitting where you are in the role that you are playing, uh, you would be able to quickly see where your thinking or your team's thinking or the operational thinking of your organization fits in, right? Now, uh, any quick thoughts? Where do you find the thinking getting gravitated with respect to the operations in your organization with Zoom? Anyone would like to talk?
Anyone? Let me just share. Am I audible, folks? Just a quick check. Yes. 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 Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I was not sure if it is a silence or it was a thinking silence or if it was a bandwidth silence. So I had to do the check. Bear with me. So uh, when we speak to organizations across, uh, I would like to I would like to be candid here. Even at the board of directors level of large multinational corporates, it's a fair recognition that most of the time, the mass of the organization's thinking dominates the bottom two quadrants. Uh, now, not just that, uh, operations of an organization, which is dominantly meant to be the delivery vehicle of strategy, where the focus is more on execution and driving the output, where it's about the rigor of making action happen on the ground. Uh, by design, if you actually notice, operations is expected to pretty much do a good job and a good delivery. Hence, naturally, what happens is the nature of thinking is what we call as an orbit maintaining thinking. When the thinking is in the concentrated around the bottom two quadrants, it's what we call as an orbit maintaining thinking because here the focus, like the way representative of the word, the intent here is to maintain, sustain, defend and grow in the current orbit. So the aim is not to make a leap happen, but the aim is to stay secure, stay comfortable and make sure that we are having a robust foundation. But when the shifting, when the thinking shifts to the top two quadrants, that's the zone of what we call as orbit shifting. Uh, where like the representative of the word, it's not about playing the game anymore. It's about fundamentally changing the rules of the game. Uh, it's not about taking a, a step, but it's about making a leap happen in the impact and in the outcome. Given this, uh, one of the problems or the ironies that we notice is today, uh, uh, my colleague had a, a talk about, about a few days back and he was also asking a reflection about the strategy of the organization, where does the strategy typically form? Now, when leaders themselves acknowledge that the strategy of the organization itself ends up being orbit maintaining, a vehicle of operations, which is just normally meant to be orbit maintaining, gets all the more a reason and an excuse to maintain the orbit. In fact, at best maintain the orbit. When the strategy itself is not orbit shifting, what is there ever a need for operations to shift the orbit? So we find that operations ends up maintaining more and more, sticking more and more into the zone of orbit maintaining. But the discovery that at least we had is there is a phenomenal opportunity to make orbit shifts happen. Now, I'd like to share some quick examples of where we have found in operations, uh, be it from our product development space uh, to a manufacturing process, to a HR process, uh, to finance, we have seen uh, transformations happening, massive leaps happening when the thinking moves from orbit maintaining to orbit shifting. Uh, let me start off with my uh, favorite example. And by the way, folks, uh, our job and our passion, our purpose of existence over all these years has been to move or help organizations and teams move from the zone of orbit maintaining to orbit shifting by design. So what I'm going to be sharing, most of the work examples, barring few, are from the portfolio of work that uh, we have done. So it comes from a certain experience of having made it happen on the ground. And I'm excited to share these with you. I'd like to start off with my favorite example. Uh, at least I think folks from India might be aware of this, is uh, what happened with the case of Arvind Eye Care Hospital. Uh, Arvind Eye Care Hospital, uh, you would be aware, uh, is based in the south of uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, it's one of those, five, actually speaking, not a well-known brand of hospital out there or not a glamorous uh, brand of healthcare hospital that we would like to be associated with. But what they're doing is something amazing. Uh, just for you to know, Arvind Care Hospital is in the business of helping eliminate needless blindness. We are talking about cataract and uh, glaucoma. Uh, and we are talking about a demand of 20 million new patients uh, per year in India alone uh, needing to, uh, you know, uh, uh, eliminate the needless blindness because they are suffering from cataract or glaucoma. Now, according to the World Health Organization data, uh, what is considered as a global average, uh, any doctor on an average does about 240 surgeries per year. Now, let's keep this on one side. 240 surgeries per year is the data that is available. Now, with this understanding, when Dr. Venkatapha Govindaswamy wanted to start Aravindai Care Hospital with a 
you know, quite an audacious goal of eliminating needless blindness. How can I eradicate needless blindness? He was quick to understand that the conventional model of approach is not going to work because the conventional thinking, the established industry practice says, in a, if you want to operationalize in hospital and if you want to deliver on the challenge of eliminating needless blindness, the focus is on creating more and more beds, increase the capacity to deliver the healthcare. The more capacity you have, uh, the more are the chances of you being able to uh, solve the problem of eliminating needless blindness. But interestingly, uh, he realized that while it's a well-established industry wisdom, it is not necessarily the most efficient operating model uh, because how many more hospitals does that open, especially in a country like India, and how many people can we touch? So the thinking drastically shifted. The intent shifted, not orbit maintained, not a step thinking, not a replicate thinking, but how do I create a leap? which meant now this is opening up a completely new school of thinking, which is transforming surgical efficiency. And now taking inspiration from McDonald's, uh, what Arvind Aikar managed to do was to create an assembly line production of surgeries. Now, I mean, I'm sure that the notion of assembly line production of surgery sounds quite absurd, but it's quite, it was a quite a radical breakthrough and today it has become a norm in the industry. And these were the folks who pioneered it. This assembly line surgical, uh, assembly line model of doing surgeries broke a lot of myths. It broke a lot of myths in the sense that why should there be one patient in a room? Uh, while there were strong regulations ago, uh, uh, for it, uh, these people were able to prove as why it is a mindless regulation, as why it is a mindless belief and worth questioning it. Thanks to this assembly line production of surgery, taking inspiration from McDonald's where a burger comes out in 45 seconds flat, uh, why can't a surgery happen in 45 seconds flat? That was a starting question. You can notice the nature of question is fundamentally different when the intent is to transform operations. The starting question we find when it is the intent is to make a step happen, the starting question is often what is the best practice out there? Uh, what are some of the best schools of thought out there? But when the intent is to transform, the question becomes fundamentally different, which is how do I transform the surgical efficiency. Where else can I go and look for insights? And look at this, uh, food industry connecting to a hospital and finally the eye surgery efficiency in Arvind Daikar Hospital. 240 surgeries per doctor is the global average. Arvind Daikar Hospital does, each doctor does 2,600 surgeries per year. That's a 10X leap on top of the global average. A 10X jump, it's not about a benchmark. No. Just think about it. Would a value like this, would it have unlocked itself if the thinking had remained with orbit maintaining? No. When the thinking shifted to, when the, when the nature of thinking and the intent moves to orbit shifting, you find how a dra radically new questions emerges in the space of operations, and the solution you get is very, very different. And suddenly you start seeing possibilities which never seemed possible before. Now, I hope that gives a quick reference point of what we mean by telling a leap in operational efficiency and not just a step, right? Moving on, uh, when we were working with one of the, the largest solar company in uh, uh, in India, and uh, this, we are working with a team which is basically responsible for the projects. So once the land is acquired, this team is responsible for deploying the solar panels, uh, getting them up and running. And this naturally, uh, just for a quick uh, in data over here, the yield of a solar farm to generate about one megawatt of solar power, about four acres of land is needed. Uh, this is, um, of course, there are latest technologies available which are far more costly in the efficiency that they yield, but majority of the cases, it stays up about uh, one megawatt, uh, uh, we need four acres of land. Now, this team, which is normally used to just going and ensuring that they do a rigorous project execution in deploying the solar panels, asked a question, why do we need to need so much more land? Can't we do something different in improving the yield? Now, there is a, this legacy design that you see here is a globally standard design. I'm sure the moment you think of a solar farm, this is the image that pops up in your mind. Now, this team, instead of just following the standard legacy design and the industry practices, started asking a completely different question. While there are extremely, well, expert driven wisdom as why a solar farm is designed this way across the world and no questions asked about it. Let's ask ourselves a simple question, which probably we never asked ourselves. This team asked, how do we maximize the solar panels exposure to sunlight in a given area? And what emerged was a 3D beehive structure, which was never conceived before. 
in hindsight, it seemed extremely simple, but surprisingly, no one had ever thought of something like this. And what was the output that came out of the prototype? You're talking about one megawatt in four acres. The leap this created was three megawatt in one acre. That's a 12x jump, a humongous jump in the, in the productivity of on the yield of the solar farm. To put it in another way, we are talking about a 12x reduction in the land footprint needed to create a solar farm that can generate a given amount of power. This is another example that really stands up for me of what we call by a transformative leap. And interestingly, it was done by the same team which had existed within the organization for 10 years with rich industry experience of having developed and designed and executed so many solar farms in their lives, never asked themselves this question, but when they asked, this very same team was able to make a transformative leap happen. Let me move into a different example. When we, 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 uh, we were working with Aquar Hotels and it was a very interesting journey here. Uh, Aquar Hotels, you would be knowing, owns the Ibis chains of hotels. And when they design, there's this team which builds the facility in itself. There is a cost per key. What is a cost per key? The cost of setting up a room is called as a cost per key, which includes the construction, the interiors and everything. Now, by, now, the moment a project is sanctioned, yet again, the focus is on, let's put in the best of the industry practices and let's develop the hotel. Now let's move to the next time. Focus is on executing it within the delivery time. But when the same team was able to shift their focus from following the best practices to questioning some of the well-established beliefs of how sourcing happened, what is considered an acceptable practice of construction and how was project management done, the very same team reduced the cost of construction of a key from 4.5 million rupee to 2.1 million rupee. That's almost a 50x reduction, a 50 percentage reduction in the cost. Now, let me give you another example. We were working with, uh, a, this is a very different example in the sense that it was a huge blind spot of what was holding market leadership for a company. We were working with this French multinational, which is into the UPS business in India and doing, and, and they're one of the top players in the market. They found something interesting. Most of the time, their products were innovative, well-designed products with a great technology roadmap. But when they hit the market, they realized that their sales, their market share was not uh, corresponding to the innovative portfolio that they had in their list. Now, what was the reason for this? They realized the blind spot was uh, they were trying to solve this problem by introducing more and more innovative products. But what they realized in the ecosystem was their time to market. Most of the time, this company was the first to conceive something that is really innovative out there. But the product development time was 18 months because each of this UPS needs its own tie, its own specification, its own vendor development. Everything is custom developed, so 18 months is the product development time. By the time, a folks from, uh, say, China or anywhere else were able to quickly assemble, put together, and launch the product far more faster into the market. So while they were the first to the mind, they were often last in the market. Now, this team took on a challenge, this new product development team, along with the manufacturing and operations, to crash the NPD time, new product development time, from 18 months to 90 days. 18 months to 90 days, and that became a prime lever in helping this organization regain its market share. I deliberately try to bring in examples from different contexts, different types of challenges. Uh, to give you an HR example, we have had a HR team which has been able to reduce by radically looking at a different induction process uh, in, the, in the shop floor, reduce the time it takes for a new journey to become fully operational on the manufacturing shop floor. The standard time was six months, because you're talking about people who are fresh from the college, they need to be trained in the industrial environment, being able to operate the missions individually. From six months, they crashed it to just 15 days, an independent operation with zero quality defect. So the examples are plenty out there of how companies have managed to transform operations in their own spheres of influence from a space of steps to creating leaps and unlocking massive value for the organization. Now, yet again, in these examples, I'm sure you're able to see how the thinking in each of these cases has deliberately moved from a space of orbit maintaining to a space of orbit shifting. Now, one thing is very, very fundamental in my, uh, ex uh, in my uh, experience, folks. An orbit shift can happen in organizations. It has happened in organizations. But what happens is the orbit shifts largely remain accidental and incidental because 
it's either person dependent or we are waiting for the next big breakthrough to happen. But massive leaps can be unleashed if there is a deliberate by design intent to move the thinking from orbit maintaining to orbit shifting. So if we want to make leaps happen in operational efficiency, it cannot be the reform game anymore. It is not about squeezing the orange anymore. It's about what is it that we need to question fundamentally? What do we need to break fundamentally and how do we make the transformation happen? So it's an interesting irony, right? What is trapping the value in organization? Uh, what is the focus? What do organizations do when they want to excel and they want to be at the best and they want to create the value? They want to eradicate inefficiencies. The focus is, the, the approach is focus on the industry best practices. Let's learn what is best in the industry and let's do it. Let's do it to our best. And we see this, op, op, uh, we see this approach all the most strongly in the space of operations of a company. What's the best out there? Let me replicate it. Let me put the best of infrastructure in place. But the interesting irony is when we make transformation happen, we'd notice in hindsight what was actually trapping the value was actually the established best practice. The belief of what is considered the best method in the industry, what is considered acceptable in the industry, what is considered, we, I'm sure you'd have heard this is the way, this is the standard industry practice. This is the policy of the company. So be it established schools of thought within an organization, within an industry, what is perceived best today? We often find only when those are questioned, massive leaps in transformation have happened, as is the case with all the examples that I shared with you. I hope it gives you a perspective of that. And that's why we find today organizations which have been successful in making leaps happen in operations, they have been, they have been fairly clear in acknowledging that uncovering and breaking value traps is a nuanced and differentiating capability because it's far more easier to go out there and figure out what is the best practice. But this is a nuanced capability and it's a strategic differentiator for the organization. Building capability within my organizations, within my operations teams to spot what is trapping the value. Uh, where am I, where are we pretty much settling to what the standard way in the industry is and probably it's time to question that. That takes for a lot of courage and it's not an easy capability to build, but nevertheless, it's a differentiating capability. Now. Having established this, uh, what holds organizations, what has been my insights and the recipe on how to make steps to leaps happen in the space of operations? Uh, one of the common uh, immediate muzzle memory, almost a muzzle memory reaction we find in organizations is the moment we realize that we need to unleash innovation. Uh, we need to, innovation is the only way to make leaps happen in transformation. So let's put frameworks around innovation, let's create policies around innovation, let's create a momentum around innovation, SOPs and whatnot. All these things that get done very, very quickly. So pretty much the skeleton is very quickly set up and we find in spite of that, we hardly find any innovations coming through. Let me give you an example. This is a quote unquote a data point. When, we are, when I was talking to the chief innovation officer of a $6 billion company, uh, he was telling that uh, they have been fairly successful in putting up a fantastic idea management system. I'm sure you would have had idea management system in uh, your organizations. And uh, we have enabled all the people, we have given them rewards, and we are just waiting for uh, innovations to come through. We are just waiting for those ideas to just bubble up. You know, he said it with such a confidence that this is absolutely going to happen. It's only a matter of time because the conditions and the climate are right. Now, the question is, is it really? Two years later, when I spoke to him, 18,000 ideas came, only three ideas were of business value. 18,000 ideas, only three ideas could eventually lead. Look at the strike rate we are talking about. What is going wrong here? We find that this is actually a myth. While structures, policies, frameworks, and SOPs are needed, what holds an organization from, from making a leap in operations happen is not this. I mean, we have seen organizations which don't have any of these make leaps happen because they have been successful in combating their mindset gravity. What do we tell by mindset gravity? This is an interesting, uh, uh, on the top uh, left, you find the enemies of innovation. This was a survey quickly done by Boston uh, Consulting quite, a, quite some time back, I think almost a decade back. In what they went out there and asked the top most innovative companies of the world, you guys are the best in innovation. Why don't you guys tell us what is the, what are the enemies of innovation? In your experience, what stops innovation? And this is what the established innovative companies of the world had to say. Lengthy development times, lack of coordination, risk-averse culture, limited customer insight, 
idea selection. You notice when you look at all these things, right? It's quite satisfying. I'll tell you why it is satisfying because it looks like almost all these are problems with just some process. When I look at this, it just seems to be a process problem. So if I get in a consultant or if I put our own minds together and if I were to develop a framework to solve all these things, a process to put all these things, then innovation needs to happen, right? No, it didn't happen. Or for that matter, very recently, when uh, HPR did a survey on what is stopping organizations from uh, innovating, it is interesting how fear emerged as the largest voice within the organization. Fear of being ridiculed, fear of being, uh, you know, rubbing my manager in the long way, fear of disagreeing with my colleagues, fear of being dumped with more workload if I open my mouth as the biggest barriers to innovation. At no point in time ever was there a message that came out that the biggest barrier to innovation was the policy or the innovation idea management system? Absolutely not. Why? What is this pointing to? Because all these folks are symptoms. What is underlying this, in our opinion, is mindset gravity. I'm choosing to use the word mindset gravity because if our aim is to make an orbit shift happen, what we find holding teams back is the gravity, the gravity that manifests in the form of mindset gravities. So let me give you an example of a team which has been able to break through a mindset gravity. This is a jewelry manufacturing uh, industry and one of the most sophisticated state-of-the-art jewelry manufacturing industry. The reason why I'm emphasizing on this folks is because when we hear of jewelry manufacturing, it's quite easy for us to have our own interpretation that this is a group of goldsmiths smitting and trying to do an individual work. That's not the case. It's not art anymore. There's a lot of science to this. Now, this process, what you see on this jewelry piece here, it's the most complicated design. What design? You see the way the stone, the large stone is set in the center. That's called as a bezel setting, the way the stone is set in the center. Now, the global cycle time, the benchmark is 90 minutes per product. It takes the best top-notch experts within the organization, within the manufacturing supply chain, and they are needed to make this happen and they need 90 minutes. And this is the global benchmark. This has been the case with, uh, be it with uh, the top-notch manufacturers of gold around the world or jewelry around the world, this is the standard process because everyone has settled that this is the best. Now this company that I'm talking about has already reached the 90 minute mark. They are already at the benchmark. So which means that they're as best as things can get. They are in that sweet spot of being the best in the industry. Now, out of no reason, this team took on a challenge and asked, how do we create a new bezel setting process? And there were some interesting conditions that they laid out for themselves. The conditions were, number one, it should be done within two minutes. Look at the shift in thinking. And by the way, folks, they didn't have the answer. In none of the examples that I shared with you, the idea existed because of which the leap, because of which the leap happened. All that started was the intent to make the leap happen. And they were so passionate about it and they were willing to break through their mindset gravities and eventually the leap happened. So it's not the answer that is leading, paving way for the leap. The intent to make the leap paving way for the answer to come in. Question things that had never been questioned before by the same group of folks. Now, what did they achieve, guys? Two minutes, they want to create a new puzzle setting process which can be done in two minutes, never before done in the world and should be done by a blind person. That's the challenge they take on. And what they achieved was eight products per minute for the first time in the world done by a group of folks who are not the PhD experts, who are not engineers, but who just wanted to unlock value. They created a 420X leap in productivity. Today, this process is named after those four gentlemen who were who are a part of designing this innovation process. Look at the value that is unlocked. And you know what? Now you didn't need the experts to make this happen because everyone used to frown whenever there's a business setting work that has to be done because you need the experts and the experts are needed for other work. Look at the value that has been unlocked. Let me give you another example. Pardon, this is again from manufacturing industry. The cost of, this is from a casting shop. Those of you whom I'm sure would be able to resonate with it. A shock absorber company, the cost, the energy cost of casting a pair of shock absorber. Shock absorbers in the two wheelers are cast. The energy cost per pair is 135 bucks. That's where this organization was. The benchmark of the norm in the industry is 85 rupees. And somewhere they had also learned that there is a Japanese company which can do it at 58 rupees, which is doing it at 58 rupees, but not made public. So 135, 85 is the norm, 55 is the benchmark. <laughs> and let me tell you something, this team, this organization has not necessarily been the pioneer of technologies. They have largely been the adopters of technologies. 
technologies that exist in the bed from top notch uh, shock absorber players and manufacturers in the world they have been basically replicating now when they took this on as a challenge and they were telling that yeah we may not have the knowledge or expertise but wouldn't it be phenomenal to create a new reference point when they questioned it they created a new global benchmark today i'm proud to say this team of the shop flow casting shop manager and his team have created a world record of casting a shock absorber feet at shock a pair of shock absorbers at just 35 bucks this is a new global benchmark something that was done not by the experts but something that was done by a group of people who were willing to question their own conditioning questioning the established norms of engineering of what is considered acceptable in hindsight when i give you the solution i'm not going into the technical details now you would find it quite simple in hindsight but surprising that no one thought of it and that's the irony of innovation right after it happens it's always sound simple so and this also provides an interesting uh, i'm reiterating another important message for you here which is that leaps happen not with a, an idea the starting point of leaps if you want to make leaps happen by design it's not with an idea an incremental goal or a stretch target but an out of the box challenge so is anyone trying to say something let me move ahead so for me uh, the message that i'd like to reiterate here is breaking the mindset gravity is far more foundational than the science or the structure or the policy uh, which is what unleashes an organization into the leaps zone now the value creation designing for value maximizing value for customers and organizations are i'm sure you would understand that while these are words that are being normally used day in and day out in the organization it's almost like a rhetoric that we hear within the organizations these are mindsets first and science later so making these mindset shifts happen is of a critical importance and mindsets don't happen by design they need cultivation so when you want to unlock operational efficiency and you want to make transformation happen the first question that we need to ask ourselves is what is the industry gravity or the mental model that i am trapped into which i need to break out of that's very very critical now one of the other common traps that we find organizations falling into is build the capability first then the magic will happen I, for, don't get me wrong folks i'm a big lover of design thinking this is something that we happen i saw happen massively in the space of design thinking organizations are bombarding uh, their employees with waves and waves and waves of design thinking and capability building and hoping for a large breakthrough to happen but yet again while well, design thinking is another methodology to make a leap happen it didn't happen because there is no demand for it leaps cannot happen unless there is a positive demand for it and creating a positive demand for value leaps is a leadership ask just hoping for ideas to come without telling and create providing a true north where in operations do we need breakthroughs unless i as a leader create a positive demand for it not a pressure but a positive demand for it we find that value leaps don't happen so we find we have worked with organizations where there are some phenomenal practices where the cxo team identifies the demand anchors year on year year on year there is an operations transformation exercise that happens where they don't think about what are the ideas to execute but where they just tell to the organization where if we make a leap happen would it be of a phenomenal business differentiator for us where if we unlock value in operations our top line and our bottom line is going to get phenomenally impacted let's just identify those anchor areas so this leadership team gets into a blue sky thinking and identifies one of the areas for the organization now the moment these anchor points are clear the then the next step kicks in where every manager along with his team identifies a value leap challenge for every five business as usual key result areas goals that an employee takes here on here he takes on an additional value leap challenge and they have been able to create a portfolio of 1000 plus leaps 1000 plus leaps 1000 plus innovation transformations have been created because the demand existed now let me put it in another way to make my point here if the demand was not placed would these 1000 leaps have happened absolutely not point in case the example that i was sharing you earlier where there was no demand capability was built 18000 ideas only three ideas of value with another organization they sit together and create where are the key themes of innovation that are all this put together folks emphasize the importance it's not just about the capability building the capability and hoping for the magic to happen it's a leadership demand it's a leadership ask create a positive demand for the capability to be channelized and one of the other things that we need to understand is the rules of game are very very different 
when it comes to maintaining orbit versus shifting orbit. And this is a huge challenge. This is quite a dicey area because leaders, operational folks who are so tuned, look at them. Let's just step back and re-examine the role of operations, right? Or anyone in your own organization who's playing the role of operations. They are designed to ensure that there is no scope for failure. They are designed, muzzle memory, they are being designed by the organization to ensure that there is no failure that happens at their end and that they are able to consistently, repeatedly deliver on something. Now, these are a group of people who have been tuned to this. Now, I'm unlocking them and telling them, make a value leap happen. Be it for the leader who is heading the operations team as well as for the team in itself, it's quite difficult because mistakes happen when organizations end up playing the value leap game with the value step game. Where in a, value, in a step game and not knowing an answer is unacceptable. It's a taboo. Failure is a taboo, right? Now, I cannot, when I'm reinforcing the same rules again, I'm not creating a play space for people to think differently. So I, when I as an organization, if I have to only, what becomes important is we have to create a different set of rules and propagate those rules with as much intensity the way the regular business policies are driven. Only then the mindset change can also happen. So I can change my mindset, but if I find that, you know what, if I'm going to try that and if I'm going to fail, my neck is on the line, no one is going to make the leap happen. Why would anyone want to do it? So I need to create play spaces. Organizations need to create play spaces, set rules which are different. And there's a clear demarcation. This is the rule of orbit maintaining. This is the rule for orbit shifting. So how do I create safe spaces and for people to play with? We hear the notion of startup accelerators, right? We hear the notion of incubators, where I'm able to incubate an idea, try it out, fail it, refine myself. We never hear the notion of an incubator, a leap incubator in an organization. Why not? Maybe we need to create spaces like that. From driving certainty, as a leader, I should be comfortable in accepting that even I am uncertain. I should be comfortable in working with my team in finding out the answer but not badgering the team as why the answer is not available readily on the table, which is what is the rule of a orbit maintaining game. What is the measure of success here is could be very, very different from what the orbit maintaining game is. Here, it is not about the target. If you don't meet the target in an orbit maintaining game, it's a failure. But here it is not about whether you have met the target or not. It is about how much leap have you made to happen. Now the IBIS hotel, the Accord chain of hotel may not have reached 50 percentage, but the fact that they might have reduced the cost from 45 lakhs they might have wanted to reduce it to 10 lakhs, but the fact that they didn't do it, they were able to reduce it from 50, 45 lakhs to 21 lakhs, it's a phenomenal leap. And the, hence you notice the measure of success is not the gap to target. The measure of success is how much is the leap that you have made happen in spite of what circumstances have you made this happen. So, and also another thing, uh, uh, just to make the point in case here, we need special purpose vehicles, guys. Uh, transformation cannot happen because there's so much of a muzzle memory way of functioning, thinking within an organization. If we need to make our folks in the mass of operations think differently, we need to create special purpose vehicles, just like the accelerator that I was talking about. We have had the opportunity where, we, where there's a company which has created an innovation school. Look at the thinking differently. These guys take on real serious operational business challenges, but it's an innovation school where they graduate out as innovators, a special purpose designed vehicle where people are able to play with the space of transformation without having to fear, where they're able to genuinely put their inhibitions aside and think. Hacks, accelerators, not meetings. Elevator pitches, not presentations. You notice this completely changes the dynamism of engagement, which is very, very important culturally for a leap to happen. So if I had to summarize folks, uh, the recipe has been like this. First, shift intent from steps to leap by design. And let's not kid. Uh, wish, uh, when I say a serious intent, it's not about a wishful thinking, but absolutely clearly wanting to do it and having a need for it. Two, create the value mindset, value leap mindset in teams and leadership. That's of a critical importance. And there are ways to do it. Now, as much as intents are needed, we need to enable the teams with the respective capability. That's the next point. And last, create the demand points for leap to happen. And of course, build the right rules and the right environment and the climate by way of special rules, special policies to make this happen. So intent, mindsets, capability, create the demand and create the climate. We have seen magic happen. Now, very quickly in the next uh, three to four minutes, I would like to share, is this even possible? Or is this a mythical, wishful thinking, a utopian thought that is being presented? 
uh, I was asking myself this question and like I told you, these are learning from work that has happened on the ground. And this is where I would like to share with you that some of the examples of organizations which have made, which have been able to maximize this recipe. When we were working with Titan company, you might have been sharing uh, Titan watches, uh, Titan jewelry based out of India. They're about a $3 billion company. The integrated supply chain team, which is responsible for the front end logistics, back end logistics and manufacturing, they had an interesting question. They had a moment of realization that, you notice as a lifestyle company, manufacturing is not the core of the organization. They are pretty much like the back end suppliers. They realized that we are just delivering to the market requirements as stated from marketing and from sales, and we are doing a damn good job out of it. So year after year, month after month, quarter after quarter, the focus is, are we well aligned to delivering to the marketing requirements and sales requirements? The answer is yes. Okay, so what next? That's in the question mode. Why have you been acting like suppliers and executors? What would it take for us to become front-end influencers? That was the birth of the innovation school, which I was talking to you a while back. Now, the innovation school is a place where operations managers and their teams come in together. The leadership team identifies the opportunity areas where orbit shifters or transformation is needed. And these people come in together and in a three month process, they walk out with a working prototype that is a phenomenal breakthrough. Now, what has the innovation school managed to do for the organization? It's not about the capability here, folks. That's definitely a big advantage. The ultimate result, I'm sure you would agree, is what is the business impact it has yielded on the ground? 60% of the workforce are innovators who have done this process by design and they're certified as innovators. Now, it's not, I'm not giving this as a template that we need to replicate this, but they realized in their organization, giving them that opportunity and getting that certification as innovators matters a lot to employees. So they went in with that demand to create a positive influence on the employees. 60% of the workforce are innovators, 70 innovation challenges have been solved. A manufacturing organization, a manufacturing team, a supply chain team and a manufacturing team sitting in an organization which is marketing led has been able to create $5 billion impact to the bottom line. 500 crores has been ordered to the bottom line of the company and several first of the world innovations have happened. What I gave you the example of a bezel setting happened from this. And for me, it has been a humbling moment when Harvard Business Review and McKinsey uh, out of their M price uh, recognized the innovation school as one of the cutting edge innovation initiatives in the entire world. Out of 160 large massive MNCs, this was recognized as one of the cutting edge initiatives because it was breaking a lot of myths that existed on what it takes to build innovation culture within the organization. Let me go to one of the largest forging conglomerate in this country. And just for you to know, they are also the suppliers for Tesla. Here, the case was very, very different. It was not just a wishful thinking or a proactively, they were in a state of a crisis. This organization which had existed for two and a half decades has accumulated into a, falling into a particular way of functioning that if we need to cater to Tesla or if we are growing global, we cannot afford to be fat anymore. We need to be absolutely lean. Efficiency is not a choice anymore. Transformation is not even a choice anymore. When such an organization in such a crisis took on this challenge, what have they been able to achieve? By the same recipe, you're talking about a 2x leap in productivity, 500 manpower getting saved, increase in plant capacity by 50 percentage, heat treatment capacity by 50 percentage, raw material savings of 500 million, 70 percentage. You're talking almost 50 percentage of the organization's current turnover in value being unlocked by a group of, op of people in the operations team who were willing to question the value traps and do something radically different than just following the best practices out there. In another organization, Anand Group, which is a $2 billion auto component company, they started with, now for them, it's pretty clear, we need to transform operations, but how do I build this as a strategic DNA within my organization? So their question was, how do we create the culture of value transformation? Across, they have 42 companies in the group, but the focus was on those seven companies, which are the cash rich companies and the cash flows of the group. Now there, what have they managed to do? Using the same recipe, they have pretty much institutionalized this process. From year one to year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, year on year, employees take on new innovation challenges, value leap challenges in the space of operations. Across levels, starting from the COO of the organization, the head of the manufacturing, head of supply chain, head of product engineering, all the way down to the shop floor to that employee who is responsible for a set of eight missions. Each one of them takes on a value leap challenge. So you notice the nature of challenge is a healthy portfolio of industry first transformation challenges, functional challenges, organizational, and as well as the individual employee level challenges. Now, again, not just the same group of people, but expanding the number of people. Today, 
1,300 people by year six, I should not use the word today. Let me come to today a little later. 1,300 people have solved 707 innovation challenges. And today that number stands at 1,500 innovation challenges being solved by a group of 2,400 years, almost like a muscle memory year after year after year, where they are rewarded completely different, they are measured completely different, whereas the business as usual is being measured completely different with two different set of rules. The same group of people have been able to successfully play both the games and get maximum reward. What is the reward? Today, 15% of the entire group's revenue comes from value leaps. And 20% of the group's profit is contributed by the value leaps made by these folks. I hope that it gives you a perspective. And to rest my case here, folks, I feel that this is a billion dollar blind spot that organizations are sitting on. I feel that organizations, they end up thinking that uh, while they say that they're trying to do uh, innovation, they're trying to create innovation climate, transformation climate, fact is that nothing has been done to maximize this value and it's a billion dollar opportunity for me. For obvious reasons, if I were to borrow the conventional stage of strategic layer, tactical layer and operational layer of the organization, I'm sure you would agree, the mass of the organization sits in the tactical and the operational layer, which naturally translates the mass of the opportunities to make breakthroughs happen thus in the tactical and operational layer. So I think we are in a space where operation innovation, making operational leaps happen is not any way less uh, appealing, less glamorous than what the folks in the boardrooms of strategy are doing. With that, I would like to rest my case, folks. I would like to open this up for questions. Thoughts, questions, comments, feel free to. Sorry, I uh, just want to, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, some Thanks, some really, uh, uh, so some thought provoking comments in there and uh, obviously it's some, it certainly rung some bells with me. Uh, the, the question I have really is, is some of these organizations are obviously quite big, uh, large manpower. Um, how, how did these companies engage at such a level to, to, to get these people involved, you know, because, uh, I mean, I, my business is not huge, but I mean, it's maybe 600 people in, in 11 different locations. And it's a challenge to always communicate uh, these kind of requirements over such a, a wide range of people. How, what was your experience uh, in the success of these companies? So uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Michael, for a great question. Uh, uh, I think in our experience, the way it always starts, and we often recommend this to the company, is to follow the notion of creating lighthouses as against making this a cascading exercise. So when we work with large organizations or even when we work with small SMEs who are just say $10 million in revenue, uh, what we tell them is let's start by doing a quick experiment. Let's put in the best of our people not just the spare people in spare time, but the best of our people, let's take them off and let's make the value leap happen. The moment that happens, it's amazing to find the cascading impact that happens. The moment we focus on creating few lighthouses and, show, and doing an extremely good job of showcasing those lighthouses and the people behind those lighthouses, suddenly people, it, it's, we are quite surprised to find the amount of positive demand, the reverse demand it starts creating instead of me having to push. Suddenly I find the next set of 50 people come in and say that I want to take on a value lead challenge. So two folk, So if I can answer your question, is it possible to do this in a distributed manner? Yes. Uh, in fact, if I were to do this if, if in your organization, just top of the mind response, not a really necessarily thought response, but more coming from the experience, I would rather prefer that what is that one location where most of the people who are most progressive and change ready to take on a value lead challenge. I would first focus on that and then start by focusing on the next location and the next location so that at least the moment I'm able to create one lighthouse across location, eventually that's going to create a demand. I hope I answered the question, Michael. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Gokul, Leslie is... Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Leslie's just put a question in chat. Um, Leslie, if you just want to unmute yourself and just ask. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to know what the steps are um, in breaking like old ways of doing things if you want to take big leaps. Because in terms of culture change and mind change, it's quite difficult for companies to adopt or to employ that. It could mm. be easy in theory, mm. but in practice is it's something Absolutely. else. Because people tend to yeah. go back, this is not how we do things. We always do. Mm. You mm. want to break the old ways of doing things, but um, how do you do that with, together with your team? Yeah, so that's the question. So, uh... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, ways and vehicles of having done this work. One of them, for example, is uh, when we work with organizations, uh, we focus heavily on ensuring that, uh, uh, you know, the first order order of business here is to ask ourselves, uh, you know, what is holding us back and what are the mindset gravities? Uh, so when we work with organizations, our focus is uh, we start by first understanding what are those mindset gravities two, at two levels. One, at a, at a people level, what are the gravities? The second interesting thing is what are the industry practices gravity that the organization is trapped into? Uh, once we do that, we work with teams, leadership teams to identify a small group of people. Again, my response, the recipe is same as what I told Michael, right? It's not about... I mean, this becomes an interesting parallel, right? We often use the statement that imagine a caterpillar asking itself, which leg do I move first, right? Or centipede, sorry, a millipede asking itself, which leg do I move first? I mean, I think somewhere it needs to start. And if we have to start with large transformations, our experience has been start with a small group, which is the most progressive, most change ready and wanting to make the change happen. With that group, we go into a diagnostic. We identify the opportunity areas for making innovation happen. And we work, engage with the team. Uh, and I, I don't know, I mean, I would go into the details, but I'd like to happy to be connecting with you or anyone who is interested in walking, walking you guys through the methodology. There's a rigorous methodology of how breakthroughs happen by design. So starting from taking on an impossible challenge, to deliberately uh, facilitating them using various tools and techniques and triggers to identifying mental models, gravities, questioning them, coming up with ideas that are breakthrough, developing them into a solution, taking them into a working prototype, there is a rigorous methodology that we deploy with the teams. And in all this process, mindset is not kept in the back end. My, you know, one of the things we find organizations doing transformation is that they look at leadership coaching as a mindset coaching. Then there is organizational development. These are all siloed ways of thinking. At least for us, when we make transformation happen, the mindset, the creative thinking, the questioning, the establishment, it all goes hand in hand. And I must say that we have been able to fairly create uh, at least a 90% strike rate, if I might say so, of all the challenges that uh, we have been able to do by pretty much doing this. And it's surprising. It's amazing how the same group of people, let me tell you something, the bezel setting process that I was talking to you about, the team members in this organization, I'm, I'm sure you would understand in India, there are trader unions and worker unions, which are often have political affiliations. Their intent of wanting to participate in the journey was to pretty much derail the journey. So they were as detractive and as against the value creation process as much as they can. But within a span of two weeks, it was the very same group of guys who wanted to create the world's first ever two minute bezel setting process. And they created history. That started out as a group of people which pretty much the management has washed their hands off, telling that these guys are detractors. It's a pain to live with. They won't be able to add any value to the organization. Now the same guys are now become the four champions of making value leaps happen. So it is possible is, is, is what I would like to say, starting with a diagnostic and a method of innovation pursuit, people naturally get the confidence. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you so much, yeah. Welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, we have just one more comment from Benu. Um, he's just said, Google, fantastic thoughts. Low-lying innovations happen. People clap over it. Big innovations are meant for the West. India does not innovate. I'm saying this working more than two decades in India and abroad. Investors in India is a joke. They're money lenders. So just your idea is great as always. We Indians would go deaf ear to this. Thanks, folks. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for the thoughts. So, uh, folks, if there are no more questions, uh, uh, just doing a quick check. Are there any more questions or I would like to just quickly uh, share one more thing with you. I, yeah. Yes. Uh, 
like uh, I, I'd like to check uh, what are your thoughts? You know, uh, we, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the, let's say, uh, real uh, near future, which is like in a two years time. And then we end up underestimating the change that will occur in the next 10 years. So we, do we, uh, like, how can we use your methodology to be ahead of this uh, underestimation? What are maybe some aspects that we should focus on uh, with this underestimating thinking uh, that, okay, uh, in the next two years, this will happen. Then you find that more happened than you have estimated. And uh, like, even if you, now, nowadays it's exceptional because of the pandemic. So that uh, things that were expected to happen in 10 years happened in, right. in one year. So, uh, exactly. so uh, we, it, if you were having like a prediction, uh, uh, we didn't manage to uh, be there on in the right time. Uh, we like uh, we have some products we sell. We we rely on uh, industry on raw material because of uh, factory closures. Uh, like the raw material is now not present, so we cannot uh, sell. Uh, uh, we cannot we cannot sell the product because there's no raw material. Factories went uh, went off for a long time, and even the estimation, you know, because of the pandemic, people went buying. A lot of uh, things more than usual. So if we were used to uh, uh, keep a safety stock, now they they bought it all. The, the, the you know the, the the paper toilet issue that happened in the U.S. It happened to other yeah. business. How could this have been foreseen and uh, overcome in this in a strategy or in an operational? Uh, strategy. Uh, your thoughts yeah. uh, would yeah. help us. Good, 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 good question. Thanks, thanks for asking. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to be honest in telling that I'm going to make an attempt to uh, share my thoughts here. Uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, things that we find organizations normally do is uh, look into the trends of change, right? And uh, trends are eventually trends that start off. Uh, trends are something that has already started off. And what research agencies basically do is that small changes that have already begun to happen are projected as trends. And uh, you know, you'd be surprised to find how many organizations, how much money they invest in following trends and, and chasing trends, which is good in a way. But that never prepares the organization for a black swan event. Uh, when we work with organizations, uh, our question is never about what are the existing trends in the industry or what is the crystal ball showing us? Because the crystal ball that organizations often gaze into, which are fantastic reports by top-notch market research organizations of the world, are as flawed as it can get. Because beyond a point in time, numbers on an Excel sheet can only reveal so much about the future. So is there a foolproof, fool, foolproof way for us to be absolutely ready uh, where I'm able to predict every possible scenario? So the answer is yes, uh, because uh, when we work with organizations, right? May I request uh, the participants to go on mute? Please. I think someone is picking up the groceries for the week. All right. So, oh, so what I was saying is that uh, when we work with organizations, right, our starting question is organizations which have been able to phenomenally do this don't wait or predict the change. They rather lead the change. Let me give you an example. Uh, when we were working with uh, this uh, Titan Jewelry division, which, is, which alone is $2 billion today, we asked ourselves a question, what would happen if there is no gold in the world? What would be our response? And what would we be selling in the shops if there is no gold in the world? You notice at any point of time, there's going, never going to be any trend report or any technology forecast report, which is ever going to pan out a doomsday scenario like this. In a way, if you notice, uh, this is a scenario which people would rather prefer avoiding than questioning. So organizations which are able to be future ready are those organizations who don't wait for the trend, but rather start the trend. And how do they start the trend? By asking themselves damn uncomfortable questions, which question their very existence. 
Now, instead of waiting for their existence to be questioned by someone else, they prepare themselves to become uh, a new avatars and create new value. So when, when an exercise like this happens, asking, create an artificial crisis within the organization. The artificial crisis scenarios, when I work with organizations, is one of the questions is what are the top five artificial crisis scenarios we can create for the organization? And you'd be surprised the most drastic scenarios come up which can be as absurd as possible. In fact, our prayer at the end of the day is that these scenarios don't happen, but we, enter, but we engage in real deep thinking on what would our role be, what would be our operational preparedness should such a scenario fold up. And you'd be fine that those organizations which had already had the starting of this thought trend and who have already prepared following by some business experiments are far more prepared to respond to this. Let me give you a scenario, a small example here. There is something called as unit linked insurance plans in India, which was the cash cow of the insurance industry. It's when you buy an insurance policy, you also get returns back because those are invested into share market. Suddenly the regulator came in and said, there's a lot of mis-selling happening, no more units. You're talking about 60% of the policy volume of the insurance industry suddenly being stopped by the regulator overnight. Now who would have ever envisioned a scenario like this? But one organization did. And that organization, while all the rest of the organizations in the industry, insurance industry in India registered negative growth, this particular organization grew 30 percentage when the largest cash cow product was removed. How? Because they were prepared for it. So instead of waiting for the crystal ball to happen, my suggestion is let's disrupt the game ourselves by asking questions which threat, threat, uh, you know, threaten our existence. That's my answer. I Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Very helpful. So, well, folks, I think you have invested a lot of time in this, right? And I don't want that to go. Uh, uh, I would love for, I took the liberty to maximize that for you. What I have done is this. Um, I'm sharing two things with you. I would love for you to go back into your organization. Forget about anything else. I think orbit shifting is a phenomenal opportunity. Transformation is a phenomenal opportunity for us. I'm sharing two documents with you guys. One document is as follows. I think this is something that if you're in a position with your own team, I would love for you to have this dialogue, which is start by identifying opportunities for transformation. Pretty much what the previous question was, right? Why are we waiting for threats to come in? Why are we waiting for scenarios where there's a no choice? Let's positively identify opportunities. Opportunities that are problem-led, opportunities that are, I mean, that come out because we are being proactive. Both cases, let's just sit down with your team and here is an opportunity, use this template. I have put the link. You don't have to worry about anything else, but at least do this exercise. It will be worth it. It will be absolutely worth it. It doesn't matter whether you're engaging with me or not. That's not the point here because we are evangelists of innovation. We are absolutely passionate about unleashing transformation and I'm staying true to that purpose here. I'm also shared with you the presentation that you have, that I have made to you today. Alex, go back to your team. Ask yourself, hey, folks, what if we do would be transformative? Here are organizations. And the reason why I shared the presentation with you is so that you are able to make a point in case folks out there have done it. Otherwise, they would be looking at you like a crazy guy who has just come back and was suddenly out of the blue and with a weekend that has gone absolutely wrong. So that you are able to make a point in case that organizations out there have done it. Maybe it's our time. Use this template and do a thinking exercise. I hope that would be a value. And I think that will be a good one hour invested in your life in this talk, folks. With that, I'd like to close. Varun, uh, any comments, any thoughts? Uh, thank you, Gopal. Um, if I could just ask everybody to quickly turn on their videos, we can just take a quick picture uh, for social media. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Nice to see you all. Nice to see someone has logged in from Hyderabad. <laughs> okay, awesome. One, two, three, and say cheese. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, folks. Uh, thanks, consultant team. It was great meeting you all. Wonderful day to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.